Father, I pray for this morning. Uh, I pray. Uh, I, I just trust. I trust you place things on my heart, my to put in my mouth uh, to speak this morning. And I pray that you're doing a work in hearts uh, this morning. I pray that much good will come out of this. That you'd be glorified and honored, and we'd be nurtured and built up. All the things that you say in your word that that you want to happen today. I love you, and therefore I preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as as Jacob was saying, we don't know how our emotions will go today, so so bear with us a little bit. I I, want to start out and just kind of talk about this week. It was a little bit unique in many ways. It it started out pretty much common for me. On Sunday, we came to church. It was a day of rest, so I rested during the afternoon. In the evening, did some house church planning. On Monday, got up and started my work in, in, in IT, and it was just kind of a normal day. But there was something that was going on kind of through those two days, and really it goes back for the past three weeks. We've been preaching. We've been preaching over us and how we are responsible for one another, that we, we actually should be into one another's business a little bit to help one another, build one another up. John preached about judging and, and how that looks in the body of Christ and that, that we each have you know, uh, specks and logs in our eyes and they need to be removed and we're supposed to help one another in those things. So, so on uh, both Sunday and Monday, I was, I was dealing with some, some of them were actually intense, some, there were some strong negative emotions. There were noisy babies. There, were, uh, there was some immorality. There was some selfishness. There was even a severe marital th- fight among you. And it was weighing on me. I was working through it. I was, I was uh, trying to, to know how to help and interject. On Tuesday morning, I got up as I normally do, and I, I'm working through preparing for today's sermon. And I was working and focusing on uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, uh, which is talking about money, right? It, it's just about money. And it's, it was talking about actually specifically generosity, that we're to be a generous people. Uh, and then I got the news of Pierce's death. And, and, it, and he was sitting right here last week, last Sunday morning. And... Uh, It changed everything. Everything that I was thinking on and working on seemed trivial, insignificant. And and it's not. It's not. But it is secondary. All those things I was thinking with, my work, interactions, money, it's all secondary. And and that's the thing I I, I realized. And and basically, because whenever you come face to face with your mortality, that we're going to die, it, it changes perspective. It, it just does. And, and you go back to foundational things. You start thinking about things that, that are, yeah, like I said, foundational. Like God exists. He is. That, that He created us. That because of sin, death is inevitable. And that He's provided a way that even when we die, to have life. Because He raises the dead. And, and the passages were coming to mind. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 32, If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Right? That, that's the, that makes sense, if the dead are not raised. And then Mark, or Matthew 24 says this, Therefore be on the alert. You do not know which day your Lord is coming. And I know it's talking about the Lord Jesus returning to the earth, but for Pierce, I would say the Lord has come. And we, we understand that. It's kind of like now we have opportunity to learn, to grow, to honor Him, to believe in Him. When death comes, that opportunity is over. It, it's eternity. We've moved on to the next. So I, when, I, when I talk with, with people just trying to understand where they are in, in belief in God and so forth, and, and I've asked this question to some of you. I, I ask a, a ba- very foundational question. If you were to die tonight and, and to come to the, to the gate of heaven and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, 
what would you say? Think about that. That is a, is a significantly important question. And I posed that to somebody this week even. But, but take a moment and think about that. Now, it's probably not actually going to go down like that. But your answer to that question says a lot about who you are, what you believe about God, about eternity, and about how to enter into God's eternity, into heaven. Well, Tuesday evening, we're going to have some neighbors over. And this is one of the things about those who do not die, is life kind of keeps going on. Right? It's an interesting thing. You, you, you're numb in a way, but yet there's still life happening. Well, while we were waiting for our neighbors to, to come over, I picked up a book that's been on my uh, um, stand there, and I've been reading through it slowly, and I just started reading it, and it was like exactly what I, what I was feeling, that I needed to go back to the foundation, to the things not that are secondary, but the things that are primary. That's a... Uh, the book is um, called The Discipline of Grace by Jerry Bridges. And it's been really good. But it, but it spoke to me, and, it, and it, he brought out what was primary. It just happened to be right there. And what's interesting is it's the primary mission of Vintage Faith Church is what he was bringing up. The primary mission of Vintage Faith Church is to love God. And, and he, here's the passage, Matthew 22, 36 through 39, teacher... Somebody's asking him a question. These lawyers are asking him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? Asking Jesus this question. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. Okay? And, and what Jerry Bridges said, he says he wakes up in the morning... And he's just excited about reading the Word, being with the Lord. He's just, he wants to worship, and he, he's excited about that. And, he, and he, one morning he was saying, Lord, I love you. And it's almost like the Spirit was saying, oh, really? And so he started looking into that a bit. So is that really what God is thinking? And he went and did some research, and he, and he went to Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you want to turn there. I'm going to read the first nine verses. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Because this is where this quote that Matthew, or that, that Jesus said in Matthew, this is where it comes from. Not just Deuteronomy 6, but Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy what, 10, 11, 19, and 30. I'll say this in some form. And also the things around it. Now, that's what I want you to see. And that's what Jerry saw. Was the, the, the things around it are what really helped him understand what the Spirit of God was speaking to him. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Now this is the commandment. The statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God is commanding me to teach you. That you might do them to, to, in the land where you are going over to possess it. So that you and your sons and your grandsons might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it and it, that it may be well with you and that you may be, multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and, and on, shall be on the frontals of your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And he goes on. And this is what he saw, when, and you can see it right there, and it's true in these other chapters of Deuteronomy, that this love of God is wrapped in obeying His commandments. They're inseparable. 
And that's what he saw over and over again. And he, and he started to understand why he was having that sense that God was, was saying these things to him. Because in this passage, it talks about commands, decrees, and laws. And it has words, action words, like observe, keep, carefully obey, be upon your heart, impress them on your children, talk of them continually, use all kinds of reminder, ways of remembering, like I'll tie them on your hand, put them on your, hand, on your forehead, like us, we'd, we'd put post-it notes around, write them on our doorpost. I've been to the Walter house. It's all over your house. I love it. But those are the kinds of things. You, you would see that this love is somehow wrapped in action, in a way. And, and Jesus... He, he said the same thing. You know, I know we're looking at Deuteronomy's Old Testament talking to the Israelites. Jesus said the same thing to us in, in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. See, we... Here's a picture. Okay, we're a picture. Cruise control. You all know what cruise control. I used it yesterday. I was going down the highway. Get up to a certain speed. And you push that button and you're on cruise control. You can kind of relax. You can coast. Carl will take care of it. That is way too ahead of time. Okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's too early. <laughs> but the thought is, is that when we're driving on the highway, we get up to speed and cruise. What do you do spiritually? And I've seen this. And I, 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 would hate to, I don't like to say it, but I, I know I've participated in this. That what we do spiritually is we come to the Lord and we're excited about the Lord, we're excited about the Word, and we speed up and we get up to the speed of everybody around us. And then we push the button and we go into cruise control spiritually. And, and what we're doing is we don't want to get, we don't want to drag behind because we want to be spiritual. We want to be in the Spirit with God. But we don't want to get too far ahead and be different. That makes sense? And that's what it looks like. And Jerry points out, he says, we really should be like race drivers. Yeah. Right? Now he perked up, right? Because <laughs> a race driver, he's not out for a cruise. He's not going to push any cruise control. He's not trying to stay in the pack. If, if he is, he's trying to win this race, first of all. But if he's in the, pass, he, in the pack, he's just trying to get behind a person so he can just launch himself out. Or he might be part of a team in a pack to do the same thing for his teammate. That's, that, that's what racing's all about. And he pushes himself and the car to its limits. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 9. Turn over there. Or I think we got it on the slide. 1 Corinthians 9. Again, these are metaphors. These are, these are word pictures to try to help us understand what God's trying to get across to us. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. He says, Do you not know that those who run a race... All run, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. It's, it's funny, because I've used this, and many sports teams have used this verse to motivate their, their sports. My primary remembrance is volleyball, girls volleyball. They would use, I didn't necessarily promote the but they would run to win. That was their chant. Makes sense in a, in a sporting event. He's saying spiritually, apply it, right? I lost my place. All right, 24. Again, I'll do, do you not know that those, all those who run a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be dis disqualified. And, and you can see all the things we're talking about right in there. Yes, it's a metaphor, but the idea is we're applying it spiritually and, and this morning specifically about loving God. Let me give you some personal metaphor examples from this. Uh, when I was 56 years old, I ran my first 5K. That was 2016. You guys ran it with it. Nada ran it. Jim ran it. Shy was there. I think Joe was there also. Jack, were you there? No. Okay. Right? Now, what's the big deal about running a 5K? Well, it's my first 5K. I was 56 years old on the anniversary of my father's death when he was 56. Now, is there, you see the relevance? Think about this from, a, from a, a grieving and mourning standpoint. This is, what, 29 years later. 
I, I'm still, still, this is, it's a weird representation of how, how mourning looks and grief. But I'll tell you one thing about that race, I did not run to win. I ran to finish and not die. Okay? <laughs> Literally, that was, that was exactly it. But I'll tell you what, I did a couch, couch to 5K thing, so I, I had to practice. It was months to get to where I could run that, run that race. And what was interesting, too, is when I was coming to the finish line, I was coming up, and I could pass a young man that was in front of me. It wasn't, it wasn't either of these guys. They were a Okay. And I could have passed him, but I didn't want to. I actually slowed down because I didn't want to discourage him. Because, remember, I wasn't interested in winning the race, just finishing. Here's the other example, and that's where that early picture comes in. Uh, in 2002, I raced carts. A friend of mine had carts, and he got, got me invited into it. And, and these are 30-minute enduro races. And, and think about it, I'm averaging 60 miles an hour, three inches off the ground. It, I loved it. It was a hoot. But in this particular race, I... Uh, the, the leader was way out. I can, nobody could see him. He was way out in front of us. But me and this other guy were racing for second place. And we would go around this track, and you can see the shape of it. Uh, my cart was faster, but he was a better driver. I would pass him on that long straightaway. I'd pass him every time on that long straightaway. And we got to this last uh, you know, left elbow there. He'd pass me every time. Seven, eight laps. That was same picture happened. But in this case, I was racing to win. I was racing to win. So every lap I was paying attention. I was learning. I was trying to focus on the cart. How can I make it faster? How do I turn these corners where he was getting me? How was he getting, was he getting me? Time after time, I got to that last lap. We knew the last lap was coming up, and I got to that. that we started out the long straightaway. I passed him, went down around, made that last curve, and I was not going to let him pass me. And I'm hanging out of the thing, started hanging on, and I beat him. You see what I'm saying? Those are the two, two differences of pictures of racing for God, of running after Him specifically about love of God. There, there's some effort that God is asking for in this, in this context. And, and think about this. I got all off my place. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. The point is, not, not about racing, the point is, is that you each have metaphors in your own lives. You can look at things that you excel in, things that you love doing. The things that you're studying, you're putting forth effort in. It could be in your education, in, in engineering, in, ba in banking, in math, in computer science, whatever it is. It could be in your career, you know, teaching, or your IT, or retail, or, or accounting, or farming. It could be kicking field goals. It could be video games, it could be flight simulators or golf. It could be training your kids or raising chickens. Okay, or growing plants or throwing pottery. I, I don't know what your metaphor is. What is it in your life that, that you're working hard at because you love it, love it? Use that as a picture of what God is calling you to do in, in relation to Him. To loving Him. In John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The, the, the point here is that we're to be growing in this love of God, and it takes effort. And remember, he says, with your heart. So how do you, how do you give Him more of your heart? It requires some vulnerability, doesn't it? It, some transparency in your mind it, yeah, it's research it's study you're trying to learn you're trying to evaluate your life from God's perspective you're getting input from others that's where all this one and other stuff comes into play in, in 2 Timothy 2 5 it says also if any competes as an athlete he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules that's where those commandments of God come in it's not that we just go out and well oh, God I'm gonna love you that's why that song that we sang before, I Love You, Lord, I love that song. That song has meant so much to me. But oftentimes I wonder, do I love the song because it's beautiful or because I really love God?
when we apply our soul to loving God, it, it's getting into your motives. What is it that's motivating you in, in all that you're doing? Are you really drawn to God? And, and emotions are, are part of that too. And I've really enjoyed, <laughs> I, it's been helpful to me, let me put it that way. To, to get to understand how my negative emotions are really an indicator to help me look into, me, into my soul and say, what's not right with God? Because that negative emotion is not love, joy, peace, patience. So, so how do I get in and transform that to really love God? I, I've, that has been really helpful to me. And then obviously the strength. We've got to put restraints onto our body. You heard it in that passage. We have to put restraints on our body's desires to resist evil. And we've got to push it to do good. Just like a car. Is, these, are, these are cool pictures. And, and, and we can relate to them. But it's all about learning how to love God. Because... because Finishing and not dying is not good enough. Because he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, run in such a way that you may win. Pierce, two Wednesdays ago, 6 o'clock men's meeting, 6 o'clock in the morning men's meeting, Pierce was here. He lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. He was not on cruise control. That encourages me. That helps me. Using that metaphor, yeah, there's still pit stops and there's rest periods and stuff like that. But the race is not done. This race of life is not done until faith and hope are fulfilled by sight of Jesus. We're not believing in God anymore. We're seeing Him. And it's love. The, love is the one that continues. Here, here's where that comes from. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Remember the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will fully know, know just as I am fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. So how do we grow in love? How do we grow in love? I've said it many times, love is a verb. And, and that's kind of right. Because it's action. Because you think about it, you know, he tells you to love the Lord. That's a verb. What, I don't know what else to do it. I'm not that big on English, but that's what it sounds like. When he says, uh, the man is commanded to love his wife, that sounds like uh, he's telling him to do something. Okay? Or, or like he says, love one another. But what I understand and understand better is more like love is, is, yeah, it's an action, but it's more of a motive. It's a motive that, that motivates other actions. It, it's, it's there kind of pushing us to do something else. So it's not really fulfilling just a feeling or a motive, but it actually has to have some action along with it. Some examples would be, you know, it tells you to love your enemy. Well, part of that would be forgiving them. Right? It tells you to love one another. You've got to do good to one another. You've got to figure out what good is, and then you've got to do it. Right? Or love your wife, husbands. Love your wife. Clear commandment. You can see in some other scripture, you've got to cherish and nurture her. That's, that's a way it would have feet, if you will. Wives, how would you love your, your husband? Show him respect. Foundational need. That would be there. To love someone, you're going to be quick to... You're going to be slow to speak, but quick to hear. You can be a good listener. Right? And if you're going to love God, you're going to keep His commandments. One of the things, if you go back to that Deuteronomy passage, you see fear. And, and we're to, we, we are told to fear God. And, and I've encouraged you numerous times to fear God. But, but fearing God is not the end. He wants you to transform that fear into love. Let me show you some examples of that. Uh, in John, 1 John 4, 17 and 18, he says, By this love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Let me, remember the question I asked at the beginning? If you were to stand before God, and, and he, they're ready to enter into heaven, and you say, why should I let you in? This is what we're talking about. He said, confidence in that day, that he's going to say, come on in. That's what he's talking about here in this passage. Okay, but he... Um, by this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as He is, so also are we in this world. 
There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. Okay, so if we're standing at the gate and we're like, "Mm." there's not this confidence and there's not a love, there's just fear, we've missed it. We've missed what he's trying to get at and all this. The fear drew me to God without question. I didn't want to go to hell. This fear of God is a motivator and it does it, but he does not want us to stay there. It needs to move from there into full love, full out love for him. Fear is not an acceptable motive, but neither is just doing things to earn yourself your way into it. You, you can't, for example, here's a, here's a silly example. You, you, you can't start a business, right? I'm, Lord, I'm going to love you. I'm going to start a business, and I'm going to hire people, and I'm going I'm to keep them hired, and that's the way I'm going to earn my way to heaven. That's not going to work, right? We all know that. We know that this is a good thing. It's a great thing to have that. And it, and it actually, God could be pleased with that but not as a motivation or, or a way to enter into, that, into heaven. It'll be good for the employees, but it'll have little or no eternal value. It won't open the gates for you. Okay? So what is it that opens that gate? And that's what he's talking about. Is that's that, what that love is. L- love of God is the only acceptable motive for obedience, for it to have the effect that God intends it to have. Without love, that act is just self-serving. So how do we grow in love? It's the next verse to what you just read. It says, if we love, or we love because He first loved us. And, and that's where, how do we move it from fear to love? Is in, it's all hidden in this verse right here. <coughs> We love because He first loved us. Because I'm one who has trouble. Am I loving? Do I, do I even know how to love? And the answer is right here. Hey. So how you move from fear to love is to receive His love. To stop for a minute and, and just take time to realize that He loves you. Here's a, here's a statement that I read. It, it says this, The conscience once cleansed, no longer retains a charge of guiltiness and of judgment. Now, when Jesus' when Jesus's blood is applied to our life, our conscience is cleansed, is what the Scripture says. Our conscience is cleansed. And, and there's only two ways to cleanse your conscience. Either never do anything wrong, or allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away your sins to where your guilt is gone. And you have a clear conscience. That's what the Scripture says. John Owen, he's a, a Puritan theologian, said this, and I, and I had just, it was very, very helpful. The greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the Father, talking about God the Father, the greatest unkindness you can do to Him is not believe that He loves you. You, you wouldn't believe how many times I hear, and, and I bet some of you in this room are like this. I know God loves, I read it, I know God loves them, but I don't feel like He loves me. What what He gets in the Scripture is you may feel that way, but you've got to take the truth of God and change your feelings. The truth is, He does love you. Each one of us individually, He loves. He loves you so much that He sent His Son to die on your behalf. And you didn't deserve it. You weren't good enough. I wasn't good enough. When, when you read in the Scriptures that, and God is saying, I love you, do you say yourself to God, oh really? In order for us to do the primary thing of loving God, we must do the primary thing of receiving his love for us individually. And that might be where you are right now. And, and I would say it's an ongoing thing to continually remember that and remind ourselves and remind one another. Uh, the next time I preach, the end of September, 
I'm going to preach 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. I'm going to preach about money. Okay? So come and, come and listen to that. Because it's secondary. It's in the scriptures. I'm going to preach it. So it's important. It's an application. This, all this secondary stuff is an application of what we just covered in, of what's primary. It all comes out of what's primary, of love for God. You know, all the money stuff, all the one another stuff, all this other stuff, just a bunch of rules, unless we really get this love of God. So what would you say? What would be a, a good answer to that question? You're standing before God, and He asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? How about this? Why, sh why should you let me in into your heaven? Because you love me. Even though I had sinned and I fall short in all things, you sent your son and accepted his death as payment for my sins. And you purchased me and have given me life. And I have loved you because you first loved me.